Good evening and welcome back to our Sunday evening live stream Bible class from Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Menominee Falls in Germantown, Wisconsin. Certainly is a privilege to have you joining us uh, this evening as we continue back looking at John's Gospel, the fourth Gospel. And we're at what is arguably the climax of the Gospel, looking at the passion of Jesus. We're going to be picking up on the lesson that we started last week just very briefly. So if you wanted to scroll down in the Facebook feed, uh, you can find the, le the lesson that is dated last week, 5.03.2020. Um, and it should cover uh, chapter 19, verses 17 through 27. Um, that'll be the, the lesson that was posted last week. And then there is also a new lesson posted for this evening, um, both in Word and PDF format in the Facebook feed. Uh, that covers the rest of chapter 19, so chap verses 28 through 42. So um, I don't know that we'll get all the way through. We'll do our best to try to push our way through the end of, of chapter 19 uh, this evening, but that'll kind of be what's on the docket for this this uh, for this evening's class, looking at trying to finish last week's lesson and then looking at the new lesson that was posted um, in the Facebook feed this evening. So uh, before we uh, set, back the, set the scene back up and continue on with our study, let's begin our study with prayer. So we pray. Lord Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. You are the cornerstone upon which we must build our life for now and for eternity. We ask, therefore, that you would richly bless us as we study your word, that you might help us to see you as the only path to eternal life, that you might strengthen our faith in you as our one and only Savior, and that you might bless all of our efforts to live lives that bring you honor and glory. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Okay, so we're in John chapter 19, the first half of the chapter. Uh, the first 16 verses is the last interaction between Jesus and Pontius Pilate, um, where Pontius Pilate essentially gives up on his attempts to get rid of Jesus or to let Jesus escape. Um, and finally, at the end of uh, verse 16, um, hands Jesus over to be crucified. And then we started last week, we started our lesson uh, working through verse 17, um, where we talked about the place of the crucifixion called Golgotha, which is the Aramaic word for skull. Um, and so the, it's just a transliterated word, Golgotha, the Aramaic word for skull. When the Bible is translated into Latin in the Vulgate, um, the Latin translation of the Bible, very influential, was the church's Bible for over 10 centuries. Uh, it was the, the Aramaic word Golgotha was translated into the Latin word um, for skull, which is Calvarius, and that's where we get the word Calvary from. So um, the place where he is crucified is either called Golgotha or Calvary, but they mean the same thing. Um, the place of the skull, and we said probably, uh, we don't know for sure, but probably a reference to the way the the, the hill looked, the kind of the, the rounded top of the hill would have reminded someone or reminded you of a, the rounded top of a person's skull. So probably why it was called the place of the skull. And then in keeping with the uh, Synoptic Gospels, uh, John does mention that Jesus was crucified among um, two other people. He was in the middle of two other people. The one thing that is unique about John's gospel is it tells us um, the arrangement of the three um, people who are crucified, that Jesus is in the middle of the three. The Synoptic Gospels tell us that he was crucified with two others, but it doesn't tell us how the three of them were arranged. Only in the fourth gospel do we hear that Jesus is at the center of the three. So um, so they go to the, they go to Golgotha, um, they crucify him. There is what we call a literary device called understatement, um, where you draw attention to something by how little attention you give it to it, how few words you might think. Um, you know, this is kind of the climax of Jesus Christ's saving activity, at least to this point. Here's finally the crucifixion, and it really gets, what, four words. There they crucified him. Um, so that's the literary uh, technique of understatement. And this is very typical of the Bible. Um, both for the resurrection and the and the resur um, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, are most are very often told in very simple terms, um, if if at all. Uh, the more the implications are explored than the actual truth themselves. 
Um, so that takes us through verse 18. We have Jesus um, actually crucified now. Um, and the rest of this section is going to um, discuss the circumstances surrounding that crucifixion. Um, so we've got the, the place. It's going to be a Golgotha, the place of the skull. We've seen the company that he has been uh, uh, crucified with, the two um, the two others, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about them in a second. Actually, let's talk about that now. Um, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and talk about that now. He's, um, it says that he is, uh, he is crucified with two other, um, and then the word that's used of them um, is leistes, um, which is the word, the Greek word that's used to describe Barabbas earlier in the account. So remember when, when Pilate asks them whether they want Jesus or they want Barabbas, um, the Synoptic Gospels call Barabbas a leites, um, and a, a leistes, sorry. And the, the significance of that word is um, more than just a criminal or a thief. It's kind of a specific kind of criminal. Uh, what um, One of the best kind of provocative translations I read was guerrilla fighter. Um, someone that was trying to overthrow the government, someone who was, um, who was trying to um, reestablish Israelite independence. And so you might have re rebellion, or maybe the, the best English translation would be something like insurrectionist. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because we are, of course, very used to calling these two other figures on the cross with Jesus thieves. We, you, we very often refer to them as the, th especially to the one on the right, as the thief on the cross. And I'm not trying to say we should get rid of that. I have described the person that way in my own teaching and preaching, and I'm sure that I will, again, in my own teaching and preaching, call him the thief on the cross. But what I do think is important for us to note is that they are not being crucified for thievery. Um, that the, the, the crime that they've been convicted of is not... It's not that they broke into somebody's home and stole something. That wouldn't be a capital offense. And even if it were a capital offense, it wouldn't be a crucifying, it wouldn't be an offense worthy of crucifixion. Um, crucifixion was, was withheld for the very worst of criminals. It was the, it was the, the great um, discouragement, you know, deterrent for, for, uh, crimes against the state. And so when, we, when you think about these two people that are crucified with Jesus, don't think thieves. Don't think that they're kind of these minor criminals who are, who are being overly punished for their sins. They're probably more like guerrilla fighters or insurrectionists, people who had led some kind of rebellion against the Roman Empire, probably involving the death of some kind of Roman soldiers or, or or officials or something like that, just like Barabbas had. Um, so these were these were not good guys. These were these were nasty, um, nasty individuals. Uh, and while I'm not suggesting that we should get rid of the term thief on the cross, I'm just I want to just emphasize the word, the Greek word that's used for them is much much stronger than thief. Um, it's guerrilla fighter or re rebel or insurrectionist or something like that. Okay, with that in mind, um, let's go ahead and read verses 19 to 22. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claim to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written... I have written. So a couple of interesting things that are going on here. Uh, it was very common in the uh, in the ancient world, in the Roman Empire, when somebody was uh, um, sentenced to crucifixion, it would have been very common for that person to either have had a placard made and hung around his neck, or there would have uh, been kind of a, a sign made and somebody would have carried it in front of the person. And um, as they made their way to the place of the execution and on that placard that was written, either hung around their neck or carried by the person in front of them would have been the official charge against um, that the person was being um, punished for, that he was being executed for. And the, 
um, titleless is the Latin word um, for that little placard, for that little um, that little sign that was either wrapped around the neck or carried in front of the person. And um, there's a traditional rendering of this. This is the title of Jesus, but really that's just the English transliteration of the titleless. Um, so sign or placard would be a better English translation. And um, this particular placard that is, we don't know if it was hung around Jesus' neck or if it was carried in front of him, but what we do know is that when he is crucified, it gets fastened above him on the cross. And it says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It says that in three different languages, the, the three languages of the, well, of Judea, I should say. Um, so you've got an Aramaic, which is the everyday language of the people of Judea. It's what Judean people would have spoken to each other. Um, think about the times in the Gospels where Jesus actually speaks in Aramaic. Or, um, or on on East on the Easter story, um, Mary calls Jesus Rabboni, which is the Aramaic word for for te my teacher. Um, so Aramaic is kind of the normal everyday language that was spoken among people of Palestine. Um, Rome, of course, or Roman, uh, Rome, uh, Roman was the Latin. I don't know why I couldn't. Um, Latin was the official language of the. Of the Roman Empire, especially the, of the Roman um, military. So if, uh, military orders and things like that would have been written out in Latin. And then um, Greek is the lingua franca of the Roman Empire. Remember that the Roman Empire, just the Romans just took over the Greek Empire and then they continued to expand it. Um, so the Roman Empire included the entirety of what had been Alexander's Grecian Empire and Alexander had a had enforced a, a program that he envisioned um, bringing his empire together. He forced everyone to speak Greek, um, and the the Greek word for Greek is Elene. Um, so to Hellenize, they Hellenized the ancient world. They they caused the entire world to to speak Greek, or at least to be able to understand speaking in Greek. And so when the Roman Empire, when the Roman took, Romans took over the empire, um, their empire were, were already all united by a single language, and that language was Greek. Um, it, this is why all of the Old Testament, or the New Testament books, all 27 books of the New Testament are written in Greek, um, because everybody would have read and understood Greek. They would, it was the lingua franca, it was the, the, um, the universal language of the day. And so um, by having the title, the title is written in Aramaic, the, the, the local language, Latin, the official language, and Greek, the lingua franca, the, the universal language, um, they're trying to make it easy for everybody that might see Jesus to recognize the crime that he has committed. Um, and so really this, this title is, um, works at a few different levels in the narrative. Um, of course, it works on, a, on, the, on the surface, in the very surface area, on the, the, uh, just on the surface meeting, it, it meaning it just gives the actual reason for which Jesus was officially crucified. So he claimed to be a king. He, he was... Um, if if you are the king of the Jews, then you are setting yourself up of self up in opposition to Caesar. Um, so you are kind of by definition an insurrectionist or um, or a rebel. Um, so it works on one level just as as providing the official Roman reason for crucifixion. He he here is the king of the Jews. Um, we know one level below that, though, really, really what's motivating Pilate to do this, he doesn't actually believe that Jesus is the king of the Jews. He just does this to nettle the Jewish leaders. He just does this as a kind of, this is kind of political backhanding, a political backhand of the Jewish leaders. They don't want Jesus identified as the king of the Jews. And so as soon as they see this, the title list, which reads Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, they object. And they say, don't write the king of the Jews, but that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. We don't actually believe that he's the king of the Jews. Um, we just brought him to you 
with the claim that he claimed to be the king of the Jews because you had to deal with it with somebody who made that claim. You know, if anybody didn't deal with him partially, then they would you weren't couldn't call yourself a friend of Caesar. Um, and so the, the Jewish leaders, of course, object to this. Don't write that he is the king of the Jews, but that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. But of course, Pilate isn't going to isn't going to give in on this point. This is kind of the whole point of why he writes it the way he writes it, um, because it is it is his kind of last revenge against the Jewish leaders. So the last opportunity he's going to get to rub it in their face. This is what I think about the Jewish people. This is what we do to the King of the Jews. We crucify him. Um, this is this is how pathetic your king really is. This is how how insignificant he is compared to, to Caesar. Um, so um, it, it is, it really is, uh, it really is kind of a sad commentary on, it's the last little thing that Caesar, or that a pilot can do to, to nettle his enemies. But then to the, on the kind of the surface level, it just explains the, the charge that Jesus has made a little lower little deeper level you're seeing the political uh, conflict that's going on between Pilate and Jewish leaders. But of course, at the, at the deepest level, the most significant level, the level of greatest spiritual meaning, um, you have an ironic proclamation of who Jesus really is. He really is the king of the Jews. He, and he really is more than that. He's really the king of the whole world. Um, this Remember this phrase, the king of the Jews, is introduced already in chapter one. I know that seems like forever ago, but... Go you know, all the way back to chapter one, the Jesus, the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, um, Jesus and Nathaniel, and Nathaniel calls Jesus the King of the Jews. So you have that whole storyline um, that begins all the way back in chapter one, finally reaching its climax here in chapter nineteen with the Titleus. Um, but of course, Jesus' kingship, as has been emphasized in chapters eighteen and nineteen, over and over again. One of the great themes of these two chapters is that Jesus' kingship is different than any other kingship the world has ever seen or will ever see. That the greatness of the glory of this king is not in dominating others, but in being dominated by them. It's not in conquering others, but being conquered by them. It's not by crushing his enemies, but being crushed by them. That that this king wins his, his greatest victory, his his real glory and his power are hidden under his humiliation and his suffering. So you have this whole kingship of Jesus idea um, um, em emphasized in the, the otherworldly aspect of Jesus' kingship emphasized here. And I have a quotation or notes from F.F. F. Bruce, who's a very famous conservative 20th century Christian commentator, um, wrote copiously, um, on the New Testament, he wrote a John commentary. Um, and here he says, the crucified one is the true king, the kingliest king of all, because it is he who is stretched on the cross. Um, I think it's he who turns an obscene instrument of torture into a throne of glory and reigns from the tree. And that little phrase, reigns from the tree, is a, is a second, is a, is a very popular second century um, church father way of talking about what's happening there on the cross is it looks like Jesus is being put, I mean, he is being put to death, but it looks like he's lost all control when in reality he is exercising all control. He's ruling or reigning over all things. This is exactly what Jesus wants to have happen. He wants to be handed over. He wants to be crucified. He wants to be killed because that is the means by which he wins the salvation of the world. And then there's one other theme that's tied into all of this, the little detail with the Titleist, and that is the fact that the, lang the, the Titleist being written in three languages, therefore everybody to be able to read, regardless of whether you were Jewish, you know, whether you're Palestinian, or whether you were a Jewish, I mean, a Roman soldier, a Roman official, or whether you were just somebody from who had, who had happened to come from other, another part of the empire to celebrate the Passover. Right? Maybe, maybe you're not from Galilee itself, um, or maybe you're not from Palestine itself, but you're a, you're a believer, and so you've come to the, celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. Um, so maybe, maybe you don't really know Aramaic, and maybe you don't even really know Latin, but you know Greek, because everybody knows Greek. Um, 
regardless regardless of who you are, where you came from, you can understand this song. And that's a, a reminder. It's, a, it's another subtle reminder of the theme of the fourth gospel, that Jesus came to be the Savior of the world, not just the Savior of Israel. If he had just come to be the savior of Israel, it would have been sufficient to have written the sign in Aramaic or even in Hebrew, right? Um, if Jesus had just come to save his own, the nation of Israel, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. If he came only to redeem Israel, then the sign would only need to be written in Aramaic or even in Hebrew. But it's not. It's written in Aramaic and in Latin and in Greek. And all of that is a reminder, a, a subtle reminder, that Jesus has come to be the Savior of all. Whether you speak Aramaic or you speak Latin or you speak Greek, this is your King and this is your Savior. This is the King of the Jews. This is the Savior of the world. Um, so this is li a little um, retelling of John 3.16 here, that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Well, here's that the, con the co connection to the world. Um, with all three languages of the world being represented on the titles. Okay, um, let's press on to verses 23 and 24. Um, so we've got, uh, we've talked about the place. We've talked about the company, the two people he's crucified with. We've talked about the sign or the titleists. Now we can talk about the, the events that surround the crucifixion itself, namely the, the, um, the gambling for Jesus' clothing. So 23 and 24. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to each other. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. So this, the soldiers did. So um, it was very common in the Roman Empire for, and even, this even goes beyond the Roman Empire. This was true even in the Middle Ages. Um, that if you, the executioner got to keep the worldly belongings of the person that they executed. Um, and of course, well, many times that was just whatever clothes the, the executed happened to be wearing at the time. Um, in, the, in the ancient world, um, a, a, a person, especially, you know, a, a, for lack of a better term, a Jewish peasant like Jesus would have been, um, basically the clothes they would have worn, they would have worn um, what is very often called their tunic. The tunic, think of it as, as, as a, like an, I don't know, how, how do we say it? It's the undergarment, it's the part of the, it's it's a it's a, a a garment that was worn against your skin, and it, it would have it would have been it would have covered your whole body. So think of it as kind of like an under robe, kind of a thing. Um, um, so that's that's the 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 tunic or the inner garment, and that inner garment would have been the nicest piece piece of clothing that you owned. It would have been the it would have been the finest piece of clothing that you owned because and it because it's literally up against your skin so it's it's the it's the the part of your clothing that was most important that it be comfortable and cool so you have that inner garment and then you would have had an outer garment something like a robe even though um that that word robe um makes us kind of think of a soft comfy Thing that you wrap around yourself when it's cold. That's not necessarily um, what is going on here, but you would have had the inner garment, the tunic, the outer garment, the outer robe, and then you would have, the person would have had a belt, sandals, and then some kind of head cover, um, a hat or a, a, a hood or something like that. So what you'll notice is that the average Jewish peasant would have had five pieces of clothing. Inner garment, outer garment, belt, sandals, hood. So there are four soldiers who are who are crucifying Jesus. They all get an equal share in of of his worldly possessions. There are five things. So they divide that those five things into four. So each gets one thing: the outer garment, the belts, the shoes, and the and the the head covering. Those each go to one soldier. 
but then you've got the fifth piece left. So what do you do with the fifth piece? Well, that fifth piece would have been the inner garment, the one, the, the finely crafted, the, the, the well-woven garment, the garment that's wo what's woven from, from one piece of cloth. And because of that, it would have been, it would have ruined the garment to have ripped it. So you might say, well, one of the things they could have done is they could have just ripped it into four parts. But that ruins it as a garment. Um, it, it basically makes it, you've taken something that's worth something and made it into four worthless things. And so what they decide to do instead of, of tearing it into four is they decide that they're going to gamble for it and um, cast lots, throw dice, so, however you want to think about that. Um, draw straws and that's not what they did but you can that's the idea um, you're drawing you know whoever gets the, the long or the short straw wins or whatever you want to do um, but what John sees going on here is a fulfillment of Old Testament um, Old Testament prophecy um, this is of course a reference to Psalm 22 verse 18 um, and John is the only one of the evangelists who draws our attention to the, this, this fulfillment, this particular fulfillment, um, that they divided my gar my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Um, there are a couple of kind of in interesting things to think about with this verse. Um, the first is that even in this little detail, John sees Old Testament scripture being fulfilled, right? Even even in this in this kind of insignificant, seemingly insignificant detail. What did they do with Jesus' clothes after they stripped him? Well, even that John sees as being a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. Um, so uh, the commentators talk about how John, and very rightly, goes above and beyond even what the synoptics do to connect the events of Jesus' passion to um, the truths of Old Testament scripture. And if you think about why that would have been, why would John have, would have wanted to go through all that trouble? Well, remember that the fourth gospel is written, at least in part, as a encouragement for diaspora Jews to keep um, witnessing to their fellow unbelieving Jews. And part of that witnessing would have, would have been to help those unbelieving Jews see how even these seemingly insignificant aspects of the Savior's passion actually fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. That, um, that you can look at what happens with Jesus and his crucifixion through worldly eyes, and it seems like this would be the last guy you would think would be the Christ. And yet when you view those same events through the eyes of the Old Testament, you see how can you reach any other conclusion but that this man is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Um, so that's why John seems to go above and beyond in his efforts to connect the specific events from Jesus' prophecy, uh, from Jesus' passion with Old Testament prophecy, because it would have been a powerful way of witnessing to unbelieving Jews, testifying to the true messianic status of this man who was crucified, um, that even even the way they divided his clothes among them was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. But then the last little um, insight that I'd like us to see from this, uh, from this passage, and, and I'll grant you this is, this is kind of symbolic or metaphorical. So this is, take this for what it's worth, the, the grain of salt that it's worth. Um, but the last time that we heard about Jesus' garments in John's gospel is at the very beginning of the Passion history in chapter 13, when Jesus washes his disciples' feet. The very first thing that he does is he takes off his outer garment. Now remember, that doesn't mean that he, he was stripped naked because he would have still had that inner garment on. But he takes out the outer robe and he wraps the towel around himself and he washes his disciples' feet. So you've got this very highly symbolic action of Jesus hum humbling himself in order to serve his disciples in this you know, humiliating kind of way. And the, the symbolic action is the removal of the, out, the outward most article of clothing. Here you have the typological fulfillment of that action. 
So the, the symbolic action was washing the feet. But that, that symbolic action, action pointed ahead to a greater humbling, a greater hum, humiliating of himself. And that's going to be the crucifixion. And now that we have the typological fulfillment arrive, it isn't the outer garment that is draws attention to, but it's the inner garment. So, um, so I, and I think rightly, many people see an example of heightening here, of typological heightening, um, that, that what was hinted at by the removal of the outer garment at the washing the disciples' feet finds its full typological or greater fulfillment in the, in the gambling of the inner garment at the crucifixion. So might we be reading more into that than John ever intended? I, I suppose that when we get to heaven, um, you might be able to ask John, is that, were you thinking that when you wrote this, the, the kind of bookends to the passion of Jesus? Um, but regardless, it's hard to deny the connection between the garments. And that the last time that we've heard about Jesus' garments was at the washing the disciples' feet. And now we hear about the division of those very same garments and the gambling away of the inner garment. Um, there seems to be a kind of a typological heightening between outer garment and inner garment, between um, symbol, symbol, symbolic action and reality. Okay. Uh, and then verse 25. Near the cross, uh, let's just do 25 to 27 right here. Um, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his disciple's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, our dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. I just have a note um, in your in the notes about um, how many women are there at uh, at the tomb at this particular point. Um, it could be two, which would be a very unlikely reading of the of the passage. Um, if it's two women, then it's Mary, the mother of Jesus, is one. And then these other three names all describe the same person. Mother, um, Mary's sister, her name would have been Mary, the wife of Clopas, and she would also would have been known as Mary Magdalene. Now, um, one of the things that makes this very unlikely is that you would have had two daughters from the same family named Mary. Um, and you can imagine how easily, how quickly that would have been confusing to have if you have two of your children. And I guess if you're named George Foreman, then you name all your kids George Foreman. But... Um, but I don't think that's the that's the normal way of, of doing it. So um, very few people think that it's two, but it is linguistically possible that um, that there are two women there. It's possible that it's three, that it's um, that it's the mother Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, Mary's sister, in this case, would be an unknown woman. And then Mary, the wife of Clopas, who's also known as Mary of Magdalene, Mary of Magdala. Um, so there, there would be three people there. Um, but probably what makes the most sense, um, and it is this is reflected by the punctuation um, of the NIV, is that there are four people there. There is Mary, the mother of Jesus. There is Mary's sister, so Jesus' aunt. Okay, so you got Mary, her sister, Another woman named Mary, whose husband's name is Clopas, and then another woman named Mary from the area of Magdala, so Mary of Mag Mary Magdalene. Um, so there probably were four people there, three of whom's names happened to be Mary, <laughs> um, but you probably have two that two whose names are given, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene, and then two whose names are not given the mother of Jesus and the mother's sister. So probably four women that are that are mentioned there, um, two who are mentioned by name and two who are not mentioned by name. The more significant um, little detail about this passage is that you'll very often in those lists that I've talked about before, um, you can go online and you can find passages of contradiction, you know, um, a list of all the contradictions in the Bible. And you'll very often find this passage on that, on those list of contradictions, um, and the reason is because John tells us 
um, in verse 26, that these four women were standing nearby, nearby the cross. Whereas in the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew 27, Mark 15, and Luke 23, we're told that there were women who were standing afar, standing far away from the cross. And so um, a lot of times you'll get this passage listed against those three synoptic passages, and you'll see, you see John got his details mixed up. Um, John, John has them close to the cross when they're really supposed to be far away, or the synoptic gospels have them far away from the cross and they're really supposed to be close. Um, there is, however, a very easy explanation for this, as there almost always is with these supposed contradictions in the Bible, um, which is that they need not be taken in the exact same moment. If you can imagine um, the spectacle that a crucifixion would have been, it would have drawn people's attention. It's, it's always been that way. It will always be that way, that people will be drawn to the suffering of others. Um, think about the way that this works out in the Greco-Roman Colosseum, right, where, they, where huge crowds gathered to watch people um, be murdered. Or even think today about how, you know, what we call rubbernecking on the interstate when there's some crash or something. Everybody wants to look. Everybody wants to get their own glimpse of what has gone on. Everybody, everybody has that heightened desire to see the carnage for themselves. Um, and so you can imagine that at a crucifixion like Jesus, that would have drawn quite the crowd um, to, to have watched him be, be whipped or flogged or however you want to say, um, flayed and within the city walls and then to have him marched out outside the city and to have him be nailed to the cross and be lifted up. That would have been all very traumatic. And you, you can imagine large crowds would have gathered for that. And it would have been difficult, especially for women like this, to have been able to get close to the cross. There would have been huge crowds that were there um, wanting to be a spectacle of this um, humiliation and, and pain and crucifixion. But then, quite frankly, after the person was crucified, things got real boring real fast, right? Because then you just have the person is just is just there on the cross um, waiting to die. And so if you don't have any kind of a special emotional connection with the person that's been crucified, after you've gotten through all the kind of the exciting stuff of the crucifixion, then it's you're not going to hold the attention of this whole, of this huge audience. You're not just going to hang around watching someone die. And so you can imagine that a lot of those crowds would have lost interest in those hours between the crucifixion and the death. And as those crowds would have thinned out and wandered away, it would have been easier for people who cared about the individuals who have been crucified to get closer to the cross. Um, so we need not see any kind of contradiction between the synoptics and John. They're just viewing the events at a slightly different time. John is giving us what happened, um, you know, after the crucifixion had taken place, but before the events that we're about to have related um, surrounding the actual death and burial of Jesus. Um, this conversation between Jesus and his, and his disciple and mother are a part of that interim section, which would have given the women time to get closer to the cross. Regardless, though, the most important thing to see in this section is we have Jesus' care for his mother on display. And I just, um, a lot of times we think about, when we think about Jesus' redeeming work, we talk about it in terms of his active obedience and his passive obedience. So his active obedience are, his, are the way that Jesus actively keeps God's commandments perfectly in our place so that his righteousness gets credited to our account, right? That's the active obedience. And the passive obedience are those things that Jesus allows to have happen to him, um, the suffering and the pain and the crucifixion and the death, so that by those things he might render the payment for sins that our sins, that our sins have deserved. So the act of obedience, the things that Jesus, the good things that Jesus does in our place, the passive obedience are the bad things that Jesus endures in our place. And I think sometimes it's easy for us to draw a line between the act of obedience and the passive obedience. 
that the act of obedience goes up to the events of the passion and then the and then the and then the act of obedience is over and the passive obedience starts. But this is a, the great reminder to us that the active obedience of Jesus continues into the events of the passive obedience. Um, that when Jesus takes care of his mother from the cross, he is keeping the fourth commandment perfectly in our place. And just to think about how remarkable this is, of all the things that Jesus is suffering, he's suffering the very pains of hell that your sins and mine and mine deserve. I mean, that's that's what he is suffering on that cross, um, no less than the punishment for the sins of the world. And yet, even in the midst of that suffering, as he opens his eyes and he sees his mother there, he thinks, "I have a fourth commandment responsibility to take care of that woman." And the way that he does that is by entrusting her into the hands of his beloved friend. John, John the disciple, John the apostle. Um, so really what's, what's most important that we see here going on is that, um, that the active obedience of Jesus that transfers all the way into the, into the passive obedience, his, his commandment keeping that goes all the way into um, his suffering on the cross, um, that he is, is so others focused that even from the cross, he's thinking about the well-being of his mother. And so maybe a, pro a very appropriate thing to read on Mother's Day mm -hmm. um, for all the times that we have not been perfect children to our mothers. Jesus was the perfect child to his mother in our place. When God looks at us, he sees the perfect obedience to the fourth commandment that we see Jesus living out from the cross. And that actually gets credited to our account through faith. Okay, <clears throat> so... That'll take care of the lesson that we put up last week, um, covering the kind of the events of the crucifixion itself. And now I'll invite you to pull up the lesson for um, for this evening, um, which will focus on the events of Jesus' death and burial. And of course, I don't think we're going to get all the way through this, but we can get a good start into it. Um, and because this is a longer, a little bit of a longer section, I switched to bullet points uh, in your notes just to kind of help keep it tight and from from getting too unwieldy. So um, here's 19 verse 28. Later, so now we have we have different things that have happened that are that are parts that are told in the Synoptic Gospels that are not going to be told here. Okay, so like for example, John doesn't record Jesus crying out. Um, Lama, Lama, Samak, uh, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's not that Jesus didn't say that thing. It's just that John doesn't re doesn't choose to record it. Um, the only words, just like he doesn't choose to record, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they are doing. Um, he, he, the, the statements from the cross that John records are, um, woman, here is your son, um, son, here is your mother, uh, I am thirsty and it is finished. So he only records three of the seven statements from the cross. Um, so there's there's time between um, verses, you know, the, the, the story of the crucifixion itself and what's going on here. Um, so later, with all of the suffering for the sins of the world that's told, and it's specifically that in Synoptic Gospels, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. I'll make just a really quick comment. I didn't put this in the notes, um, but I'll make a quick comment for those of you who are interested in Roman Catholic theology. Um, the Roman Catholic Church does something very interesting with verse 28. Um, they note that it follows immediately after verse 27, uh, 26 and 27, where Jesus takes care of Mary. And they view that as the as the most important part of the passion. Um, they think that is the last part that needs to be done, is that Jesus takes care of Mary because Mary is that important, right? So Jesus takes care of Mary, and then immediately Jesus recognizes that everything is done. And so he, and, and then he you have these things. So um, it's very interesting that a Roman Catholic reading of the passion history, what we call um, the third word from the cross, I think it's the third word from the cross, um, uh, mother, we dear woman, here's your son. Son, here's your mother. They kind of take that as being the greatest statement from the cross. The 
the, the greatest work that Jesus does, he takes care of Mary. Um, I'm not trying to underestimate the importance of what he does for Mary there, but uh, what's the, the significance of this, knowing that everything had, had now been finished and so the scripture would be fulfilled, that doesn't look back at what has just been said. That looks ahead to what is about to be said. The climax isn't that Jesus takes care of his, mayor, of his mother. The climax is about what the, the scriptures that are about to be fulfilled and what he says. Um, and uh, one other thing I'll make, I'll make about this these opening verses is, these opening words of verse 28, is that in, in stark contrast to... Um, to the enemies of Jesus and the fourth gospel who almost always unwittingly are fulfilling scripture. They don't even realize that they're doing it. But um, but over and over again, they do things that fulfill scripture. So just for example, take the Roman soldiers dividing Jesus' clothes among themselves. They didn't do that because they thought, oh, there's this scripture we need to fulfill. So let's divide his clothing among us. They divide his clothing among them for their own reasons. And it just so happens that by doing so, without them knowing it, they fulfilled scripture. But that's not the case with Jesus. Jesus doesn't unwittingly fulfill scripture. He knowingly does so. So it says, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled. So Jesus is intentionally, even in the midst of his suffering, Jesus is intentionally doing and saying things that fulfill scripture, um, which again shows this theme that we've seen throughout the passion history, that Jesus is always in control. It may not look like he's in control, but he's always in control. And even now he's in control and that he is, um, he's, uh, he's doing things and saying things for the express written purpose of scripture being fulfilled. And the first thing that he says that scripture would be fulfilled is, I am thirsty. And what's difficult about this passage, I am thirsty, is that there is no Old Testament passage that specifically says the Messiah will say, I am thirsty. So the question is, what passage does Jesus have in mind? John tells us that Jesus says this to fulfill scripture. Well, what scripture does Jesus have in mind to fulfill? Um, some people have suggested Psalm 22, 15. Um, it's a good guess because Psalm 22 is clearly messianic. Psalm 22 begins with the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So those words that Jesus speaks, lama, lama, sabach, um, eloi, eloi, lama, sabachthani, then Jesus says that he's, he's clearly alluding to Psalm 22. And Psalm 22, 15 says, My mouth is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, which is obviously a reference to great thirst, right? His mouth is so dry that it's like a dried out piece of pottery, and his, there's not even enough moisture in his mouth to make his to keep his tongue from sticking to the roof of his mouth. Some commentators, especially Catholic commentators, suggest that it's um, Psalm 42 or Psalm 63, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Um, that, though, is a very meta, would be a very metaphorical reading of the verse, that he's not really physically thirsty, but that he's, that he's thirsting for God or something like that. Uh, again, it's a good thought, especially in light of the fact that he's been separated from God in the midst of his sufferings. Why have you forsaken me? But I tend to think that that's an overly metaphorical suggestion is that it's not Psalm 42 or Psalm 63. Psalm 42 there is clearly a messianic psalm. Though. Um, probably, though, the best suggestion is that it's a reference to Psalm, 9, uh, Psalm 69, 21. Psalm 69 is a clearly messianic psalm. It's actually quoted twice in the fourth gospel, chapter 2, verse 17, and chapter 15, 25. Both cite Psalm 69. And in Psalm 69, 21, we're told that they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Now you might say, that passage doesn't say I am thirsty. I realize that, but think about what's going to come next, right? Because Jesus says, I am thirsty, verse 29, because he said that, a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it 
put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. So um, the, the fulfillment of the passage, um, the, 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 the Old Testament passage that seems to be fulfilled is this idea of drinking wine vinegar. Um, that because of his thirst, that Jesus, the, the Messiah, is going to drink wine vinegar as a part of his, his passion. Um, and so by saying, I thirst, Jesus puts into action, um, the, or he puts into effect, or he puts into motion, the action that will lead to that particular aspect of his passion being fulfilled. Regardless, though, um, the messianic or redemptive historical implication of the statement is that the son's perfect obedience to, to the work of his father. That's, that's the emphasis, is that Jesus is so interested in fulfilling the word of the Lord, um, of doing everything according to what the Old Testament scriptures said, that he is intentionally invoking the Old Testament scriptures for his own saving purposes. Um, about verse 29, one of the things I'll note is that um, we ought not see this drink that is offered here that Jesus takes. Um, we ought not see this as the same drink that's offered in the Synoptic Gospels before um, or at the beginning of the, of the crucifixion, um, where we're told that there was wine mixed with myrrh, and myrrh would have been used in this context as a sedative, um, something that you gave to the to the victim to prolong their suffering because they couldn't necessarily feel the pain as harshly. They would struggle longer. Um, Jesus had turned down that drink with the myrrh in it. As soon as he smells the sedative in it, he refuses to drink because he's going to suffer the, he's going to drink the full cup of God's wrath. Um, so this is something different. This is another drink. Um, it was the kind of the sour wine vinegar that would have been on hand for the Roman soldiers to drink. Um, what's kind of unique, though, about or what is unique about John's account, because um, the Synoptic Gospels tell us about this later drink, too. But the, what's unique, unique about John's account is that they have the soldiers offering him this drink on the stalk of a hyssop plant. Now, um, that might sound familiar to you if you've. Maybe if you, um, if you or your church recently um, studying the Passover for Monday, Thursday, and you may remember that when the Israelites painted the door frames and the lentils of their, of their, of their homes at the Passover, they painted the blood of the lamb onto their door frames, door frames with the hyssop plant. So the hyssop plant was the brush with which the, the blood of the lamb was painted on the door frames at the Exodus. The hyssop plant is also what's used at the time of the, um, uh, the enactment of the Mosaic Covenant. Um, the hyssop plant is dipped into the blood of the sacrificial animal and is sprinkled over the people. And the hyssop plant, the hyssop plant is what's used to sprinkle the blood of the covenant over the people as they enter into the Mosaic Covenant with God. So there is a salvation historical significance of the hyssop plant. And especially because the New Testament specifically identifies Jesus as our as the Passover Lamb, the great Passover Lamb, um, um, who gives his life so that the angel of death would pass over those who put their faith in him. Because Jesus is crucified on the day of preparation, the day the Passover Lamb would have been crucified, or would have been killed. I um, you know, all these little connection or connections or tie-ins between Jesus and the Passover. Or think about how many times there have been connections between Jesus and the Passover in the fourth gospel as a whole. Three different Passovers are talked about in the fourth gospel, so more than any other gospel. Um, so one of the great themes of the fourth gospel is this connection between the saving work of Jesus and the typological symbol of the Passover. And this little addition that it was the hyssop plant, the stalk of the hyssop plant, that they offer this sponge uh, drenched in wine vinegar for Jesus to drink um, is... Um, help strengthen those Exodus connections. Rachel. Kathy, can you ask, was this a normal action on the part of the soldiers to give a drink to a crucified person? Uh, so the question is, what, was this a, a normal 
um, action. I, I'm not sure. I'm not comfortable saying one way or the other. It is maybe you might argue it is kind of an unusual act of mercy. Uh, why why would they do this? Um, uh, regardless of what motivated them to do it, they do it, and it's and it allows um, it it allows another prophecy to be fulfilled, which is Jesus is going to cry out in a loud voice, which he wouldn't have been able to do if his throat had not been recently refreshed. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Was this kind of normal practice? I don't know enough about crucifixion practices to know whether this would have been remarkable for them to have allowed this or not. But, um, uh, but regardless, it, God allows it to happen as a part of, of his providence so that this next and final word from the cross can be spoken. And then verse 30, um, that's where we'll stop for tonight. Verse 30, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So I just want to mention two things quickly about this verse. Um, this is, of course, is a super famous verse, um, John 19.30, um, the very famous statement from the cross, it is finished. It's one word in Greek, to tell us thy. It's the, um, the, the, and, and it's the, Third person singular, um, perfect passive indicative of to complete. So literally, it is completed or it has been completed is the significance of the statement. Um, the, the question, of course, is what is it? What is it that it is finished? Liberal scholars have, have for centuries now have um, read this as Jesus' statement that his life is over. That the, what is finished is his life. Um, my life is over. But that is a very foolish um, way of reading it. It, it fails to recognize the um, all the textual clues that we're being given by the evangelist that this is the culminating event, right? So you've had in verse 28, knowing that everything had been finished is the same verb that's used in verse 30, right? Um, and then it comes right before with this, he bows his head and gives up his spirit. So um, the, the significance of that word to tell us thy, the, the best kind of English force that I could give it, um, I think about the old 1980s show, late, late 70s, early 80s show, Mission Impossible, um, that mission accomplished, right? That's, that's what, when Jesus cries out to tell us thy, really what he's crying out is mission accomplished. He's saying that the reason for which I was sent to this earth the mission that God gave me to complete, that mission has now been accomplished. That, that work is now done. Um, there's no more work of salvation left to do. It's done. And the last little note that I'll make about this verse, verse 30, is just the note that um, even here, the very last moment of Jesus' life, I want you to notice that Jesus' life is not taken from him but that he willingly gives it up. Remember what he said in chapter 10, that no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. My father loves me because I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. Notice that this passage specifically says that the reason that Jesus dies is because he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Jesus is in control even of the moment of his death. Um, Jesus is in control even of the choice of whether to die. Um, he, it's not that decision isn't made for him. Even now, he, um, this this little um, this the way the verse is stated reminds us that even at this point, even at the very end of ends, Jesus is still in control. And uh, there's this little poem, literally as a mini poem. It's just four lines long from. Um, S.W. Gandhi, and I've never heard of anything else this person has ever written. I don't even know if it's a male or a female. Um, but the, the person wrote this little poem about this moment. He hell and hell laid low, made sin he sin or threw, bowed to the grave, destroyed it so, and death by dying slew. Um, so what I, what I think is very beautiful about that is notice that all the verbs are active or all active verbs he laid low 
he overthrew, he destroyed it, and he slew. Um, that's what the that's what the poet is trying to capture. That um, Jesus is the actor. He's not the one who's acted upon. He is the one who is acting as he gives up his le- his life at the end. Okay, so that's a really good place for us to stop. Um, next week, I think what we'll plan on doing is we'll pick up at verse thirty one and just have in mind to to bring chapter twenty to a close, and that'll give us the opportunity to start fresh the next time we meet. Um, at verse at chapter twenty, which is the um, the story of the resurrection. So we've got two chapter. We have the rest of chapter nineteen, and then just two chapters left to finish um, John's gospel. So thank you for joining us tonight and for going through these very special um, and um, noteworthy verses of Jesus' life. Let's close with the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Thank you very much and hope to see you again soon.